Welcome to the ATP Project, Season Change Sickness. In today's podcast, Matt, Steve and I discuss popular Western and natural methods to treat colds, flus and other bugbears. In today's episode, we give the flu shot a solid review and shed some light on some dodgy natural medicine practices that many of us fall for every year. As always, the information in this podcast is not designed to diagnose, treat, prevent or cure any condition and is for information purposes only. Please discuss any information in this podcast with your healthcare professional before making any changes to your current lifestyle. Stay tuned. The ATP Project is about to start. Welcome to the ATP Project. Delivering the irreverent truth about health, aging, performance and looking good. If you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, ready to perform at your best or somewhere in between, Then sit back, relax, and open your mind as Jeff and Matt battle the status quo and discuss everything health-related that can make you better. Welcome to the ATB Project. You're with your hosts, Matt, Steve, and Jeff. G'day, guys. G'day. G'day. Today, we're talking about season sickness, when the season changes and Mm -hmm. how you get sick with it. It's funny, because I was only talking to Tony about it the other day. She's saying that she's feeling a bit fatigued and a bit tired more than normal. I said, this seems to happen every year Mm -hmm. or a couple of times a year. It's, It's weird, but a change of season can bring on all sorts of things, and it's timely because we're going to be talking about colds and flu mm. and you know why you go to the doctors and why they prescribe certain medications and the mm-hmm. impact of those. And obviously, Matt, look what nature has to say in terms of other things that you can do. What else do you want to talk about today? Ooh. I want to talk about the, the latest results from the, uh, the, 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 the flu vaccine that came out and the published in the New England Journal of Medicine. That was interesting. Was this for Australia reviews. or was it for US or global? Uh, Australia. Or? Yep. Australia mm-hmm. rates came out, and um, particularly in the bad viruses, we can talk about that. We can yep. talk about Tamiflu. We can talk about oh, Tamiflu. That's that's a great one. I so mean, we'll this came about with the, SARS the and all that treatments it, and the and the natural treatment medicine as well. Was oh. it N1H1? I forget what it was. Was it the peak, it, was it avian bird flu or SARS or was it? Peak? No, look, t- Tamiflu is a scam. No, if what happened? I know, they come out with scam. SARS. So when SARS virus, remember the SARS virus yeah, that was yeah. being evil and was going to kill the world yeah. and affect mainly the Chinese originally got it. Mm-hmm. When the Chinese don't know what to do, they typically use licorice root um, because it's good soothing anti-inflammatory, especially for the respiratory tract, but just happens to inhibit viral replication. Mm-hmm. So because the SARS affected that part of the world where they had a little treatment locally that helped, um, it eradicated the virus before it killed the world like they suspected and then mm. there's a shitload of Tamiflu left over. Is that yeah. pretty much the story? Pretty much. And well, then they said, well, let's quickly worry about the avian flu that's going to infect humans and destroy the world and then the sheep and then the pigs and all those things to sell off the Tamiflu they made mm. for SARS um, and then the Tamiflu expired. Business. Then the Tamiflu expired. Um, yeah, and, and so and then Australia, the Australian government took all of it and, 20 then, million. And, and then went and got a whole heap more made because every time someone said there's a potentially a virus that might come, they think, well, we, Tamiflu, we've convinced Tamiflu is the answer. Well, I mean, it's, again, as somebody, what the, that old saying is if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. No, no, the Australian government doubled down on that one. Yeah. I think we had 20, we had one flu vaccine for every single man, woman and child in Australia, 20 million. And I think... They all expired because I think less than 5% of the population actually went out and, and, and got this Tamiflu from this dreaded, you know, killer virus that was mm. going to come and kill everyone. I, I still love it, though. From a business point of view, fear and greed. Man, fear is a great motivator. Mm. And if you can trick the government into buying all your sh- soon-to-be-expired Tamiflu, which mm. is shown to be completely yeah. ineffective against SARS yeah. anyway. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, that doesn't exist good anymore. Good business model. But if you, have a, if you have a look at the whole concept, like now coming into winter into Australia, yeah. so on the morning shows now, it's like, man, flu Blue season's coming. Yep. It's going to be the worst one ever. Mm. Um, and they, they start the scare campaign. So they start the fear and the greed campaign I like straight fear, away. Fear, fear I, 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 I love how they name the flus, the avian flu, the bird flu, the swine mm. flu. Mm. And the reason being is because when they that when these flus infect animals, that changes the uh, genome slightly on the the prior on the on the on the virus RNA, mm-hmm. and um, that's where the name comes from. But the name sounds scary, doesn't it? This yeah. is the Avian flu, mm. the bird, that, that's all, it's just a minor change in genetic shift, That that's all those mm. names mean. So, so explain it, to me the H1N1 then, because that was a combination between yeah. the pig and the and the bird and the orangutan and the Himalayas, I don't know, but um, that was an unusual flu that they said was going to wipe out, you know, basically everyone. Well, well, the swine flu was a H1N1 flu, that, that, that's a different type of right. thing, 
The the bad one is a H3N2, by the way. But we'll and what's that? that? Okay. That, that's like the influenza A one. That, that's the one that kills people. Right. Mm. The H1N ones are, are usually less harmful. So the swine flu is actually less harmful. It still kills the elderly and very rarely, you know, it's not considered a, a bad flu. So so it's it's one that, that a lot of people get and it is put into the vaccines. Mm-hmm. Um, the only problem with the vaccines is the way they make the vaccine is that they look at the Northern Hemisphere and go, oh, yeah, there, the flu's over there. They inject that flu into a fertilised egg, like one you eat, like an egg. With a black dot. Chicken egg. It. Like a chicken egg. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And that re- replicates it and, and you take the vaccine out of that and... They attenuate it, this, and then they, do, they kill it, don't they? And then yeah. they, they put it with an egg junk so that it can actually... The body goes, oh, that's bad. They then have a look at the genetic material and go, okay, let's build up antibodies to that flu. I understand the principle yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine released results from last year's one. Um, and, and this uh, last year's flu in Australia? Yep, yep. yep. And, no, and this is flu vaccine. Oh, yeah, the flu vaccine. So how effective it was. And was this the Cochrane Review? Not not yet, but we'll oh, get to okay. the Cochrane Review one. Um, these guys estimated that, that based on all the evidence that it was about 10% effective. Right. So one in 10 it's people. It's about as good as placebo. Oh, probably slightly well, worse. Is 10 to 15 percent. Yeah, it's percent. slightly worse yeah, than effective. a placebo. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, that, that's what New England benefit. But, but the, the, after after saying how bad it was and all, all the problems, their their weird conclusion. Weird. You, you're just going to love this. Well, this, if it's so anything like the so other one, just, it was, let's in, double down. In perspective, yeah. just just before he goes on yeah. with a big drum roll punchline. Yeah. yeah. Understand that what happens. So in the natural medicine world, we get criticised all the time for not having studied. Things okay. Things aren't studied effectively prior to us using them. Apparently, sure. they don't have the double-blind clinical trials. We don't have decades worth of studies on these things before making these claims mm-hmm. and that sort of stuff. And that's the constant mm. criticism. Now, to to make a vaccine, mm. they have a twelve-month period from when the the virus from last season before the next season. So they actually have a six-month window mm. to design a vaccine, mm-hmm. trial the vaccine, mm-hmm. test the vaccine before they insist everyone has, like, well, they would love to have compulsory flu vaccines. Mm-hmm. And a lot of um, jobs Zig and occupations Heil. they do, mm-hmm. like in the elderly home and the daycare centres, they insist that these staff have these things. So they have government initiatives saying everyone rush out all over the TV. You're all going to mm-hmm. die unless you rush out and get this flu vaccine. Mm-hmm. Six months trials to use it. And then what happens after they give it to everyone, then they go back retrospectively, collect the data to see how effective it was. No, they don't actually trial After it. After they've given... They don't trial it. There's no trials There's no to trials. see if it works. They before just go... they insist you have it. Yeah, this is what happened in the Northern Hemisphere. We're sticking in this year's one for the Southern Hemisphere, six months later, obviously. Mm-hmm. And they inject it, and they sow afterwards. And in this case, last year's was 10% effective for the H3N2 virus, which is the influenza A one, the bad mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. So uh, anyway, but they went through why it was so bad and all the process and all that sort of thing. And, and at the very end of the study, they said, and, and this is what blew me away, they said, you know, how bad it was and didn't work and, I don't know, we've got to work and on it Side effects and all yeah, that all of stuff. Yeah, all the side effects. Risk versus, oh, oh. risk versus benefit ratio. Always yeah. keep in mind risk versus benefit ratio. Yeah. What are the risks of side effects and what is the actual benefit from this thing? So they've shown 10% benefit, yep. perhaps. But, and mm-hmm. there's, there's side effects, so I'll get to the side effects. Mm. They said... However imperfect, though, current influenza vaccines remain a valuable public health tool and it's always better to get vaccinated than not vaccinated. According to what information? Well, not according to the information in the previous paragraph that they just mm. published. Right. Because mm. according to that, that information, it says, however, no one should get this and everyone, we should re- mm. redesign this thing if it's only 10% effective. Mm. Well, let's take the premise that vaccines are uh, effective, the flu yep. vaccines are effective and, and, and safe and, and that the risk reward ratio is is a benefit but clearly in this season based on the information they provided it was mm. not no. so it's it's pretty hard to swallow um last year's flu vaccine results and then turn around and say this year is going to be better well what was then the advice because i, I think if i mm. remember vaguely they've doubled down they've said yeah. you know what this was a cheaper vaccine uh, mm. let's actually go and, and and spend more money on more vaccines that's what they said on the morning show so yeah. on the tv morning shows they were saying the reason why this one was ineffective because mm. they went cheap and well, at this time they're going to go expensive they're going to invest a lot they're going to give a lot more money to these guys that tricked them last year because yeah, you know what's really cool about that? I love it. Man, we can triple the price. We can mm. triple the price of our products that we sell. They're going to work better. Mm-hmm. The reason, if anyone out there has used any of our products that we make, they didn't get the results that you expected, mm. go back to that shop, pay them double. 
give that give that store owner double the money I'm, I'm, and it'll I'm, work better. I've never known a, a, an industry where there's been a big failure and the 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 response is well, give more money because they're failing. Mm. And the I mean, because they don't they don't have an opi- uh, they do not have an alternative opinion. When was that mm. published, Steve? That was published uh, April thirtieth, two thousand and eighteen. Yeah. So you see what's happening here. So this gets published April. They've already developed the vaccine mm. for the winter this year. They would have yep. started that last winter yeah. when they did it. When they so when they went and found the viruses that were going around last year, they in used, northern hemisphere, in so the northern in January, hemisphere. Yeah. So they used the northern hemisphere of bug yeah. in January, or whatever. They get six months to work it, create a vaccine, pump it, experiment out on us. Mm-hmm. But the the uh, do you want another little issue with with the they, they had a big push on last year to get everyone vaccinated. I don't mm. know if you remember the ads on TV and for the flu vaccine, yeah, yeah. the elderly yep. and all that sort of thing. Oh, this and, is cool, man. Yeah, uh, uh, the data. I remember it was um, here we go uh, the year, in 2016 they had 91,000 cases of confirmed flu right the right. bad flu yeah uh, after that big push in 2017 you know massive push of vaccines and all that they got uh, 250,000 cases wow okay so more than doubled and, and what was their um, r- explanation for it that? was a bad flu year bad flu year so we need to vaccinate more hmm so this is why they use those sort of data to justify the fact that, so we had 90,000, then 250. So this year's probably going to half a million people will get the flu because of the, the rates. Of, I, so we need to vaccinate more. This, mm. this Even just, though the evidence shows it didn't do anything. Yeah. In fact, it was worse. It, it's kind of weird. Because you don't know, understand too. So, you know, you, you gave a quick summary of how the vaccines work before, yeah. Jeff. But so understand, so when your immune system samples something. So your immune system sampling everything that comes through. And what the immune cells do, these like dendritic cells or these other, they're called antigen presenting cells. They get this baddie, they rip it into bits, they break it into fragments, and then they present it out to their mates. Mm-hmm. The naive immune cells that come out like wide, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed, what are we going to do? You know, what are we going to kill? They go, here, look at this. Anything that has a little marker like mm. this just go and smash it you mm. run out to the skin you go to the tonsils you know you go down here mm. and um anything that looks like this just kill it okay mm. so what the whole concept of vaccine is presenting one of these fragments of a bug or presenting a bug or something to the immune cell so they rip it apart now understand when you get a cold and a flu and you get fevers you get aches and pains you get inflammation and all those horrible things it's actually your immune response creates those symptoms so those people that get the flu vaccine not only do they not get the immune protection, but they actually get injected with an antigen to trigger an immune response. Mm. So it gives them flu-like symptoms. Yeah, that's, so when that's you important. have the flu, uh, flu vaccine, you are giving yourself a version of a flu. Mm. So you will give yourself an antigen which will induce an immune response, which will trigger fevers and aches and pains. Hopefully, aches, the antibodies then are translated to the naive immune cells so they've mm. acquired an antibody response and can go through and effectively kill things. Otherwise, all you've done is presented a dead bug or a live mm. bug or something to your immune cells where they've tri- triggered a reaction as if you've had a cold and a flu. Right. So you may never have had a cold or a flu that season, but you're going to have one if you have the flu vaccine. Yeah, but exactly. what they argue, obviously, is that the um, side effects that, that happen are obviously on a much reduced scale. You're only getting minor um, you know, flu-like symptoms as opposed yeah. to like the full-blown flu. Some, no, you, you don't get the flu. You just get the yeah. effects of the flu, the, yeah. which can be last about a week, and the flu lasts seven days. Yeah. Right. Instead but, of a week. So, same, same. So, so, yeah. It just depends, so, you know. Like, yeah. the theory is what you said is yeah. that it's not as exaggerated mm. because yes. you don't have a full blown infection. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it kind of feels much the same. Mm. 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 And there's some other things about the flu vaccine, which, as I said, I understand can, the Can pre- I give you premise? some good news of the flu vaccine? Why? Yeah, so no, go could, yeah, no. There's yeah. no aluminium in the flu vaccine. Well, that's what I, You know what, Steve? You must have been reading my mind because I was just thinking, but for me as well too, again, we, I always come back, and I don't care whether it's vaccines or what have you, mm. I always like nature is best, yeah. right? And aluminium, we did the podcast Aluminium Alert, if, yeah. if anyone wants to but, familiarise themselves with that. Mm. It's yeah. got to be preserved with something. Oh, so well, what? Oh, well, it, all right. There's there's a bit of mercury in there. So, so thimerosal. So yeah. thimerosal. Wasn't it after? So after nine eleven, um, and then yeah, was it George Bush and the Homeland Security Bill said you can't sue the makers of thimerosal. Mm. Uh, it, in amongst the thing, and then the member that what? they said, "What the hell's that? What's thimerosal?" And everyone goes, "Oh, that's the mercury preservative that goes into the vaccines they're going to give to the military." And so the military can't go back and sue the government for vac- vaccination reactions from thimerosal. Yeah. They also linked it to everything. They took thimerosal out of all the 
um, MMRs, the measles, mm. mumps, rubella. They took thimerosal out of a lot of a the... Other, them, they yeah. banned thimerosal in a lot of the vaccines we give to children, but they're right. still using mm. it in this. So what does mercury do um, uh, when it's injected, which is obviously very different from being absorbed through the skin yeah. or being um, orally taken? So yeah. mm. when it's injected, what does it do? It, it's straight in the bloodstream. Mm. If you had a mercury filling, you know, those fillings, that, and you accidentally swallowed it, mm. you would low likelihood of toxicity yeah, because of mercury doesn't get absorbed over the GI tract. Right. The problem is when you chew on your teeth, if you chew on your teeth, the mercury is released into your lungs and that's absorbed in the body. So it's a trace amount, but it's still very dangerous because it's a fat-soluble uh, mineral. Mm -hmm. So it stays in your body. It's neurotoxic for your brain, causes all sorts Look, of things. Look, for that reason, Steve, I had, all, I had, I had quite a lot of fillings, uh, yeah. very soft teeth. In mm -hmm. fact, almost every... Um, tooth of my mouth had fillings in it when I was growing up. Mm. Um, I replaced them all with um, caps and porcelain and all mm. the rest of it. So uh, for that reason, mm. now I wasn't suffering any side effects and some people don't, but mm. some people do and they've said that since they've actually taken out their aluminium fillings um, that they feel a lot better for the it. So Yeah, the, yeah, mercury, the mercury one. Um, yeah. There's a little bit, little bit more bad news to run by. Bring it on. It is preserved with something else too. What? Formaldehyde. Okay, yeah, all right, that's handy. Yep. But what's the impact, Steve, of both the mercury and the formaldehyde on the systems on the amount that are inside? Now, again, everybody is different. It triggers a humoral immune response is one of the challenges. Yeah. So this is it. So just quickly, I'll get back. I'll let you have a word. Let me tell you something cool. Okay. So Because this links into why the change of the season creates colds and flus as well. Right. And this is one of the reasons why these vaccination concepts kind of increase our risk of infection rather than prevent it. Our immune system split like a seesaw where one side kills infections and the other side flushes away allergies. Mm -hmm. So when, like a seesaw, when one side's up, the other side's down. So in the change of season, everything starts to change, okay? Things start flowering, starts, mm. starts, other stuff starts dying. You know, we get a lot of these weird changes in pollens, dust, um, bacterial exposures and that sort of stuff. But parasites and that sort of stuff can thrive at different times of year. So pollens, foods, dust, pollutions... Um, change in temperature in the air and that sort of stuff can significantly change our mucosa and that sort of stuff with temperature change all of those things drive up our flushing allergic responses mercuries um, other toxins and pollutants and chemicals will also trigger a humoral flushing response because there's nothing there that the immune cells can actually engulf and remove as part of this inflammatory challenge so it triggers a systemic inflammatory humoral response and all of those things release these chemicals that tell the body our priority is flushing away these mm. large things like parasites pollens foods are massive mm. compared to a microbe or a virus and in doing so the resources towards our anti-infectious defense are suppressed so we actually get predisposed to infections and cancers and that mm. sort of stuff by suppression of our anti-infectious defense right just while I'm talking about it, so those sort of toxins do that, um, those pollutants and everything do that, and those preservatives will all drive that up, just like colourings and flavourings and additives in processed and rubbishy food, they all drive that predisposing to infection. Then when you get infection, if you go to back to the doctor and use an antibiotic or a corticosteroid cream or one of those anti-inflammatory symptomatic relief, the way they make you feel better is by suppressing the immune system again. Remember when I said when you get a challenge from a vaccine, you feel like you got the flu? Yeah. It's actually your immune system that makes you feel lousy, not the bug. Yeah. So what actually happens is when people go, they feel lousy because their immune system's fighting stuff because things have been allowed to grow, they then take a treatment like an antibiotic or a prednisone or something like that to reduce the severity of their... Uh, or they, they think they're taking it to kill the bug because they take this stuff and they feel better. Yeah. They think the bug's gone. No, your immune system's been suppressed. So that's that's a big part of the pre the cycle of infection. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with the argument that we have. I, I, I subscribe to, which is around fevers, especially for children as well too. If it's mm. not dangerous, if it's not getting to the point where you know it's above a certain level, mm. the fever is actually there to do a job, which is yeah. to kill off the bugs. By using things like um, you know paracetamol and other things like that to take the edge of it, yes, you know the baby has a better night's sleep, which mm. is you know, and also the parent can need that as well too. But mm. as far as killing off the bug is concerned, Tony and I always used to you know monitor the the temperature mm. so long as it didn't get into those the dangerous levels mm -hmm. of course that, mm -hmm. that's different oh, yeah. but allow the fever to actually kill off the bug as it was intended but also yeah. using such processes what we call diaphoretics which are things that will increase your sweating and other things like damp cloths and fans yes. and things yeah. to reduce the fever yep. keep it in a safe level without using an immune suppressant um i think i can't remember this is another one of those stats that i made up on the spot oh okay maybe. But remember, I don't know, you might remember, remember there was a study talked about for every one degree 
that your temperature goes up, you get a it was something like a fifty times increase in natural killer cell oh, activity. Yeah, there's, there's remember those? So I, can't, was, I can't remember. I can't remember the exact yeah. numbers, but it was something like a. I'm pretty sure it was fifty times the increase in the natural killer cell activity oh. per one degree okay. increase. So, let's look yeah. into that and come you, back. You, Maybe you, post you asked, on. You asked me a great question uh, about what the effects of formaldehyde and mercury on the brain. On the body. On the body. Mm. The, the honest answer is because they don't do clinical trials on this, they don't know. Because you it's remember not that ethical. It's, yeah. Well, well, they, they just mm. don't do clinical trials on the flu vaccine because it's... Mm. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there, is a, there was a prospective study in C on the effects on children and they followed one brand. Mm. And again, this is a fairly new study and they found out that there was a 5 to 14 fold increase in kids developing narcolepsy they yeah. were just What's simply narcolepsy? Oh, falling asleep like wow. for sort no of reason. passing out for no reason wow they just sit there no, narcolepsy is people falling asleep inappropriately wow and that so, was a mercury formaldehyde yeah yeah man that's so, hey you know jeff like as the managing director with the atp stuff we have a stage gate system that we use for product development yep can you imagine trying to run that within six months Right. Like we take years to develop mm. product. To go through our stage gate system of, you know, the research, the literature review, all these thousands of documents we have to go through and then all of the trial phases and the quality mm. control, all that sort of stuff. Can you imagine mm. no. running a stage gate system within six months to create a drug that is insisted that every man, woman and child uses mm. without any trials or anything. Well, look, we're a light, agile company as well mm. too. We're not a, a massive no. massive organisation with and multiple departments having But we would never, we could never employees. do that. No, we could never Lord, even... Well, when you were talking to me about that, I'm like, oh, how did they... I, I wasn't actually going to say anything. It's like, how do they actually get that out on time with the oh, information? Yeah. Well, not lo- well, you can tell they have to be they have to be manufacturing yeah. and making this thing before they've done any research, or they I mean, don't, and then they just manufacture it at the last minute. With they they just have a they have a bit of a, 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 a guess, guess, educated guess of which mm. strain to put in there, and then they just hope for the best. And honestly, yeah. that's that's all they can yeah. do. If, yeah. If, yeah. Look, if this thing works, well, you got mm. six months. Yeah. You? Mm. Yeah. Let's say it, let's say it's one hundred percent effective. Mm. Then all they've got to do is go right. These are the viruses in the norms, northern hemisphere. Let's hopefully it'll travel seven thousand kilometers. It doesn't change. It doesn't mutate. Doesn't have yeah. any antigenic shifting or anything like. That. It doesn't change. And you hope and you have to make a vaccine and and then you have to manufacture it for millions mm. of people mm. in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. You, you can't. You, you can't try. Do you that. know this whole stuff has totally ruined like Batman and everything for me. Batman. Yeah, I mean, because seriously, like every time that poison ivy would turn everyone into a tree, he just quickly goes home, makes a vaccine, sprays it across the city. Oh yeah, he was, he was a hero. You know, like I always looked at these superheroes that would quickly pump this sort of stuff out. It's probably part of the propaganda that oh, tricked What's, me wasn't into that thinking. Uma Thurman, that, that was one of the worst Batmans ever. They had Doctor Freeze in it, and you know that was a terrible Batman. Yeah, there's you. heaps. Of, no, I'm not doing movies. I'm reading my little books for the kids. Oh right, yeah, right, yeah. Okay. and they're doing these things where they he every time someone does something weird like that, he quickly goes home whips up a vaccine out of someone that he saved yeah. and then sprays it across the city. And I'm thinking, good on you, Batman, you saved the day, but no. Nah. Mm. So he's, yeah. he's part of the machine. Yeah. He's just Amazing. a pawn part for the big, man. Part of big brother. Part of propaganda. Well, look, you know? mate, if, you, if, if, you, if you don't want to get a vaccine and you're going to get the flu, you can always take Tamiflu. You know? Yeah, really, Steve-O. Yeah. That's the, so that's the SARS swine flu, <laughs> avian flu. And why would I, what, well, tell me more about well, because, Sell it to me. Because, all right, well, I'll, 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 I'll sell it to you. Okay. Right. <laughs> flu, flu lasts for seven days, right? Now, yep. we want to knock that thing over as quick as possible, all right? Oh, yeah. Now, uh, meta-analysis, which is huge studies on Tamiflu, when it's given a dose correctly by a doctor, all this sort of stuff, reduces the flu from seven days to 6.3 days. M- hang on, Steve. And so, you're being a bit cheeky here. I'm going to pull you up. All right. Because what about for the elderly and the young that uh, have a higher risk oh, of death? Sorry, sorry. Um, young people, yeah. elderly, pregnant people have never been studied. It's unethical to actually study and test that product on those people. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. They're the people that are told they have to use it but, because yeah. they're high risk, but they're not well, allowed to um, do be any study studied on, on them. But yeah. okay, well, what about then the fact that they and we can acknowledge that more of those people die yeah. um, because of the flu? So yeah, yeah, but not at Sunday lunchtime. <laughs> like I mean, yeah, what I'm saying yeah, is, I if don't... you get the flu one Sunday, what yeah. Steve O's saying is instead of the following Sunday evening, you're feeling better. It's the following Sunday morning tea, you're feeling better. Well, so the Temi flu will save the people that were about to die at lunch on Sunday. With, with, with the kids, I can tell you that there, there were kids tested in this and oh, it yeah. said uh, oh, the were. effect in children was not significant. 
cool. Who, who, who published that report? That was published. Let's see which reference is that. Test seven, going to seven, four, five, six, seven. That was published. Uh, Oh, that was a Cochrane database systemic oh. review. Okay, well, I was going to so say. So it's a big, big who, study. Because, yeah. I mean, Cochrane is the gold standard. Yeah, that, I mean, that's what I was going to say. Analysis. So this is some yeah. little hippie bunch of tree huggers yeah. down in Nimbin who put together this review based on three people. Yeah. No, yeah. okay, it's Cochrane. Nah. So Cochrane, hang on, Steve, you had another Cochrane review with uh, vaccinations, didn't you? Oh, that yeah, had some yeah, crazy ass right. stats. Because, you know, we were saying before it's 10% yeah. effective, yeah. which means you've got to vaccinate, what, 10 people to get one person covered? Yep. yep. So they felt that it was 10% effective. So. That For every 10 the, vaccines, one person's covered. But the Cochrane review, Cochrane review sound on the that, flu vaccine found... Uh, 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 71 people would need to be vaccinated to avoid one influenza case. Hmm. You know what? Those are the odds I love <laughs> if I'm a pharmaceutical company. You really? Well, I, 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 sick. That's they, they, you horrifying. love it if you sell cough mix, if yeah. you sell symptomatic relief for colds and flus, you love it because when they get vaccinated, they feel like they got a cold and flu. So they go and buy mm. their cough mixes. And, and you, know what, are all you know what the best cough mix is that I found ever? The best what? thing to prevent a cough is Wasn't a laxative. Tamar flu. Oh, well, I was going to say Irish yeah. moss. Then, no? Seriously, instantly they stop coughing. They're like, mm. Yeah, <laughs> you give someone with a bad cough a laxative, and that's why laughter is the best medicine, except for diarrhea and yes. asthma. Yes. They're the two things you don't want to use to prescribe laughter. Oh, yeah. but the, um, Reminds me of this woman that I saw one time on a trampoline. Why would you go on a trampoline if you had <laughs> diarrhea? And she's jumped up and she's landed on her bum, and <laughs> seriously, it was like it's a gone through the trampoline. Like a hydrant bush. Oh, oh no! There's, an, there's an image all of our listeners. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> not going to be able to get out because I just because my trampoline's got like that. Um, it's not like a solid plastic the one we grew up on. They're all mesh now. Yeah, yeah. So just a yeah. You can't through. fall off like you used to. What, what, oh, mate, I can fall off anything. Oh, and my kids are just like me. We got one of them ones with a cage around the outside. Yeah. The thing's constantly on its side because they constantly jump and hit the walls and knock the whole thing over. We never had those walls as a kid growing no, up. No, I, I, could have, I could have done with some of those spring-free oh. trampolines when I was younger. The amount of times where those things pinch oh. my legs or... Yeah. Oh. yeah. But oh. we survived. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yep. Oh. Okay. Anywho... So, right. so, so it's else? a little, so, little bit of bad news so the doctors, the flu. Sorry about that. So basically, if you go to the doctor for the cold and the flu, um, if it's a viral infection <coughs> there's nothing really they can do well Tamiflu is so, useless the Tamiflu is useless and that's their main antiviral mm. I mean they've got other for specific viruses like herpes and HIVs yeah. And, yeah. and all those sort of um, stuff like there's other antiviral sort of drugs but mm. when it comes to a change of season the cold and flu a virus that's mutated from one year to the next mm. Mm. Using old school medicine, supporting your body's natural defense mechanisms makes more sense than trying to create a silver bullet that's going yeah. to annihilate these things because yeah. it's just not the way the world works and they just keep mutating anyway. Well, the thing for me as well too, before we get into maybe some ways that you can try and um, support your immune mm. system to reduce the, the side effects, make you a bit more resilient, definitely you know improve your chances of surviving the flu if you're mm. older as well too. These are things that you should be doing every day, not just to support your immune system, but your general you know well-being and health. And many people, as we see, are deficient in a lot of these um, mm. basic nutrients. And there's mm. some other things, man, mm. I'm sure you and Steve are going to talk about herbs and things mm. like that that can help as well too in oh, short yeah. periods of time. But before we get into that, the thing mm. for me that really upsets me a lot with when I hear about people in the health industry, um, you know, uh, uh, aged care workers mm. and childcare workers and all the rest of it, being forced effectively saying, if you, you know, mm. effectively you yeah. have to do this, it's actually against um, the... Um, uh, what came together after the Second World War where they went oh, through right. the Charter? Mass medicating is illegal. Yeah. It is, insane. because this I is what the Germans did. It, it, it yeah, basically, yeah. it's part of the... Um, what's what's the overarching global government that we oh, have now that we bow down to? organisation? Yeah, 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 as part of that, but... Um, Anyway, oh, yeah. the the thing that came out of the Second World War, I've, my mind's gone blank. Oh, yeah. That they came out with the Charter, but basically for human rights. And one of those things was is that you weren't. Um, it replaced the League of Nations. Why can I not think of the oh. name of this massive organisation? Who who are the troops? The, with the blue caps, yeah, yeah. throw it uh, out to the audience. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know who you mean. I'll, I'll think of him. I'll think of him. Yeah. Anyway, we've anyway, a, you're in represent. United Nations. Yeah, United okay. Nations. Well, bloody yeah. hell! So I can remember League of Nations, but I yeah, can't remember yeah. United, United Nations. United Nations. Anyway, the so, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. No, no. Yes. But what it came Why down didn't to. Why did they make a sequel of that? Well, I don't think that it did was that well. Steve was quarter, fantastic. Quarter main. Mm. I loved that. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah. Anyway, Sorry. what I was going to say is that um, had Val and Hel- Val and Helsing had everything, but who oh, nice. knows? Didn't work. But what it comes down to though is that um, forced medication was massive through Nazi Germany, massive, yeah. right? And they said that nobody would ever be forced to take medication um, ever again. Mm. But yet. They're so effectively they saying water. They insist on vaccinations. Well, the, we're not really forced crap. to drink the water, but yeah, they're kind of getting around it, you know, because you can go buy spring water. But if they start then eroding, oh, well, we're not going to have spring water now because of plastic contamination and blah 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 blah. They can get around it. But that's the thing that worries me big time is actually the erosion of your rights mm, and your yeah. ability to say no. That's yeah. what scares me more than anything. And your ability to question, like. Medicine's not a religion. Going to your doctor asking for evidence and proof and saying all this sort of stuff should not yeah. offend them. No. <laughs> like they should be able to actually go through yeah. and say, hey, yeah, of course, we've looked right into this. And it's your body, of course. Let's discuss this together and make a decision together based on... It's like, no, you do it. I know what's best for you. You will do what I well, say. It just it feels very religious. they don't religious, look into it. They you don't know, care. Back in the dark ages with the Templars and the, well, the, yeah. unless you do what I say, you're, you know, it, but that's what how doing. dare you question me? Well, we heard, yeah. Matt, that story of the uh, woman that went to the... The, the doctor recently yeah. and was prescribed some medication. I can't remember exactly what yeah. it was. And all that she did was she said, oh, before I administer that to myself or to my child, I'd like to look at the, you know, the... Ingredient um, list. The, the, the counter, uh, you know, the, the, the side effects. Contraindications. And contraindications and all the rest of it. So Reddit came back and said, look, I can't for these, these reasons. Can you explain to me, you know, why you didn't tell me about it in the first place? And can we discuss this? Because mm. I'm looking for mm. an alternative that I can give to my child, mm. I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. The doctor flew into a rage. Yeah. It basically yeah. had D and, and effectively walked... Walk this woman back out yeah. to the front and and said, "I'm not. I'm oh, not right. talking yeah. to you." Wow. There's another one that basically said, "Oh, I don't want to do it because it's preserved with aluminium." I said, "No, it's not." Then they said, "Get get us the flyer." So they got the flyer out and showed the ingredients included aluminium. They said, "See, it isn't not sir. and just spat the dummy and said, "Go away." Jeez. But so the funny thing, but you got to realise too that mm. the doctors can't even go back and question the medical association without being kicked out so don't forget too doctors get even more trouble so like we go through and say to doctors i want you to think outside the box i want you to be my naturopath as well as my doctor the doctor goes back to the medical association to review or ask a question then they get struck off the medical board they get in big trouble too so it's it, that's why i'm saying it's like this big weird cult where you can't question you just got to do what you're told and the rest of us suffer you the consequences to, you just have to question and don't just accept mm. as i said what we say yeah. what anybody says because you know there's there's Everything needs to be challenged. We need perspective to too. We need oh, perspective. So, totally. for example, mm-hmm. when you were talking about the Tamiflu case, yeah, what that reminded me a lot of was the exact same research they said for vitamin C. Oh, yeah. So yeah. don't forget, vitamin C reduces the duration of a cold and a flu by over. A, and then this vitamin C study, they said three days um, is a typical cold and flu. Yeah. And it reduced it by a couple, two to three hours yeah. over three days, which is almost no, exactly the same. the same as the Tamiflu over seven days, doing it by what five to six hours. Um, oh, so vitamin C, but totally. vitamin C will du- reduce the duration of a cold and flu a little bit, obviously, but what it does do is it reduces the severity of a cold and flu mm-hmm. by controlling mast cell degranulation, inflammation, mm-hmm. oxidative stress, and that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. when we're looking at these drug treatments and that sort of stuff, if you want to use an antibiotic or a cortisone to make you feel better, they're doing that by suppressing your immune system and creating immune dysregulation and microbiome um, problems mm. and fungal overgrowth and parasite overgrowth and that sort of stuff. When you use a natural product to stimulate your immune system's response, you still feel lousy because your immune system's up. You still get all that mm. sort of stuff, but you can also stack it with some compounds that also help to reduce some of the symptoms and side effects and make you feel better without suppressing your immune system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's the beauty of natural medicines. You can create a bit of a holistic protocol and show how it all works. For example, there's lots of cool research now where they're combining things like turmeric with other immune-stimulating herbs to show better effects. Like, for example, turmeric's a very good anti-inflammatory and what we call an NRF2 activator, which we talk about a fair bit. Turmeric's very... So what it'll do, if you combine turmeric in with the other immune-stimulating herbs, turmeric reduces the amount of inflammation, reduces the amount of mucus, reduces the amount of aches and pains Mm -hmm. associated with the immune. So it it down-regulates the exaggerated immune response so you actually feel better without actually getting in the way of um, the anti-infectious defence. In fact, it enhances the anti-infectious defence of the other herbs that you combine it with. So little things like that make it naturopathic um, prescriptions. But... If we want, you know, I want to talk a little bit about some 
something positive and yeah. like how we can pre- prepare ourselves for the change in season, mm-hmm. protect ourselves and then give some treatments. Absolutely. And mm. look, just before we go positive, I want to say this as well too. For the first you know, half of this podcast, we've really been giving you know, flu vaccines a bit of a bash and rightly so yeah, because suck. again, there's a lot Results of poor information. Poor. There's a lot of really mm. bad marketing mm. out there. Mm. There's a lot of fear that drive mm. people to do it. Mm. Same thing with vitamin C as well too. Yeah. The natural health industry is not always a bastion of light that it should be either. Because no. Again, where there is fear and greed where mm. people can make money they mm. do the wrong things vitamin c has been completely overblown i think yeah. especially when you look at the synthetics and again have a look at the podcast are my vitamins the are doses. your vitamins killing you yeah, because we, we we have a there is plenty of people to have a crack at there's not yeah. um light and dark here there's shades no, no. of gray everywhere there are yeah. definitely some evils yeah. and there are hopefully some white knights out there well, but yeah yeah that's all, well, well just while you're talking while we're talking about vitamin c so we talked about how it reduces the duration of the colds and flus by a little bit but it definitely reduces the severity of the cold mm-hmm. and flu and it okay. does help to support a healthy immune system mm, sure the dose that we're taught to use in the health food stores, um, so the, the, the ladies in <laughs> Those the, are the days. I shouldn't say ladies, but the people that run in the nutrition section of these health food stores and that sort of stuff that are pumping out, the, the, they're just reading the brochures from these companies that are mainly pumping out ascorbic acid. So the doses that the research shows is you need about 150 milligrams up to about 500 milligrams of vitamin C per day to support your immune system mm-hmm. to prevent or treat colds and flus. The most products in the market are a thousand milligrams, mm. so there are five hundred or a yeah. thousand to start with. So they're, they're at the top end or double the actual dose. And then they're encouraged to have up to six thousand milligrams per day. Basically, keep taking it until you get the green apple splatters, is what they'll teach you. But those squirts that you get, that's actually not just from water soluble vitamin C. That's a production of hydrogen peroxide on your membrane. Mm. That's creating a, a d- damage to your membrane, creating leakiness and permeability, and you got all reducing the integrity of your mechanical barrier, that's your first line defense. So, okay. so lower doses of vitamin C more mm-hmm. often makes sense. Um, and not only that, they're synthetic as well too, yeah. are they, Matt? Well, well ascorbic acid yeah. ascorbic acid, really, but I mean, we got the... Um, um, There's no bioflavonoids though. No so, bioflavonoids. Uh, uh, sorry, so this one I meant is just, yeah. it's just a straight and compound. I'm glad you yeah. said that because what's happening, I don't know if you've seen it in my email stream, I, I subscribe to a few different newsletters and things like that. Everyone's talking about this mast cell degranulation syndrome or these eosinophilia syndromes and things like that. So people are talking about these immune cells yeah. that are all over the body releasing too much histamine mm-hmm. and that's causing all of these inflammatory problems. Anything from fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. It'd actually oh. be a really good podcast itself. This the eosinophilia reactions and these mast cell releasing. So these chemokines and, you know, your, your interleukin 17s and yeah, the TLB, yeah, yeah. all those sort of things now, they're linking back to inflammation in the collagen, causing all these sort of problems blah, blah, blah. Mm. What they are is they are immune cells that release too much inflammatory compounds. Mm. The way to fix that is actually with these bioflavonoids. Bioflavonoids stabilize the mast cells and stop them from releasing histamine. So we can use antihistamines and all that sort of stuff to stop the rashing and the sneezing, or we can use quercetin, rutin, Mm. luteolin, um, Mm. those compounds that will actually stabilize the mast cell and stop it. So normally in nature, like for example... Our vitamin C in our multi-food is amla powder. So it comes from a fruit called the amla. Mm. Um, and what it actually is is 50% ascorbic, ascorbates and it's 50% bioflavonoids and um, those sort of things. That'll mm. actually go through stabilising mast cells. That's what you'll also find in nature. Mm. For example, um, perilla is one of my favourite herbs. Perilla, perilla frutescens, you can make a salad out of it. It contains mega doses of luteolin. Um, studies on 200 milligrams of luteolin per day we had a 90% inhibition of um, histamine within 24 hours sort wow. of thing. So significant changes and release of, um, I think actually I think it was over a month, sorry, uh, not 24 mm. hours, it took about a month, but then they got that 90% inhibition of histamine release, means you're not taking any histamines all the time, you don't release as much histamine, so you don't get as much inflammatory reactions. So, oh, and long time use of histamines. It's, part, it's a mega doses of luteolin, but mm. the rest of it is all these bioflavonoids and other nutritive factors. Mm. Amazing. Hey, Something right. else I learned really right. recently. One of the other things that really controls eosinophilic reactions, especially in muscle tissue, that causes pain and is associated with DOMS, but also associated with immune problems and viruses and the fatigue from viruses, magnesium deficiency. Ah, it is crazy because you know yes. when we're doing this magnesium, a lot of magnesium research at the moment, and you know, saying magnesium's an off switch. Mm-hmm. 
make sure you're capable of switching off is the way I kind of explained it. Mm. The way magnesium works is it stops calcium from rushing into cells mm -hmm. and calcium's the on switch. Yeah. So when you get an immune trigger to say you've got a virus here, it's actually calcium rushes into the cells to trigger the release of histamine. It's calcium that rushes into the cells that tells the body to release inflammatory mediators, to release oxidative bur 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 Give me some choker, I'll start her up. <laughs> no, um, so um, what I'm saying is magnesium can actually be an off switch for a lot of reactions mm. that we weren't aware of, including immune function and that sort of stuff. A magnesium mm. deficiency means you have an exaggerated response to everything. Well, mm. Zinc deficiency. Well, mm. again, and there's not a lot that I know, Matt, but what you told me about zinc, especially mm -hmm. for the immune system, is probably one of my go-to things. No, yeah, I mean, I even good. printed off a thing. I'll give that to Steve-O to put into our notes. But yeah. I printed off this thingy, just a picture, that basically shows all the different aspects of the immune cells from the cat. So what happens, you know, I said the immune cells, they've got to rip stuff apart and show their mates. That is a zinc dependent process. Right. Yes. Um, and then when those, they show their mates, these stuff, they also release these chemicals called cytokines. And these chemicals will say, hey man, it's a virus or it's a mm. bacteria or it's an allergen. And those chemicals are determined what sort of immune response they release. Zinc is required for those chemicals to be released. Right. Mm. Then on the outside of the naive immune cells, they have these little antennas that pick up on those chemicals. So when the big immune generals yell out to the body to say, kill this stuff, that so the big immune generals need zinc to be able to speak, um, the chemicals are all zinc dependent and the antennas on the naive immune cells that don't know what they're doing are also zinc dependent. Wow. And so if you don't have zinc, then not only can your body not launch an initial defense, but you also can't um, initiate a systemic proper defense. Plus, then after your body's had a good chance to kill off all this stuff, a whole heap of chemicals come out to say, okay, chill out, back off now. They're all zinc dependent, zinc dependent as well. Too, yeah. so, so if you've got a zinc deficiency, your immune system's an idiot. It so has no idea what it's doing. The, the base, I mean, I, I, I I look at things, I mean, I, I can probably remember to explain that to my mum and to my family a bit better, but mm. I think, Matt, you were saying that taking an adequate amount of zinc um, increases your immune system by like a factor of, was it two or three or even? Yeah, it depends how deficient you are. Yeah. Of course, yeah. but yeah. I mean, it's significant impact on, as it mm. helps with um, white blood cells, like yep. um, yeah, but all you know, phagocytes and, and lymphocytes and dendritic yeah. cells and yeah. all the rest of it, doesn't yeah, it? It helps yeah. with all of that, which all powers your cells, yeah. yeah, yeah, I heard him mention Jeffersites in amongst there. Jeffersites. They, um, they had, um, with, uh, <laughs> um, with zinc deficiency, you're basically your body does not know it's got an infection, mm. right? And it does not know it's supposed to fight it, right? And that's the big point. So, you, and the same thing with like zinc, you know, um, you, you, your wounds don't heal, all that sort of stuff. So, taking zinc, vitamin C's, and that sort of stuff, making sure you're not deficient in those things is extremely important. Yeah, um, we we often, you know, you know, here we talk about hormones a lot, and, and zinc mm. is, you know, incredibly important for your hormones and and for your nails and all this sort of stuff, and that's absolutely true. But it's it really is an immune mineral, is the way we, mm. when I first learned about. It. it was it's so That's important. What we talked about hey originally yep. it was all about the immune system. And, and guys mm. lose more zinc than women. Do you want to explain that mechanism, Matt? Nope. Yeah, no, no, but you can no, leave that to no, I'll tell you another interesting hormonal we, fact in regards to the immune system is estrogen dominance will drive up the anti allergic defense. Mm. It makes you more predisposed to rashes, mm. um, sneezing, hay fever, and is a main trigger for the mast cell degranulation. So those people that have regular histamine and allergies look at yeah. estrogen as a potential cause. Yeah, it's, and estradiol asthma, you know? is, is also a potent immune driver too, mm. and that's why a lot of women get more autoimmune diseases. Yes, yeah. you know yeah. they get all water, you know more. And so what you were saying before and, though, when you were talking about okay after the events over zinc sends out the signal or is, mm. is responsible for the hormones or the or everything coming out and saying, hey, chill off, calm mm. down now. So people with autoimmune as well too, like or the potential of developing it, zinc mm. is going to be really important. Yeah, 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 it's a good one. Make sure they're not zinc deficient, mm. but you don't want to overdose with zinc mm. with something like a zinc picolinate right. that might bypass your natural absorption techniques. That's mm. why it's good to use zinc yeah. gluconates and things like that. Because mm. if you actually overload with zinc, you'll increase the amount of receptors and you'll increase the amount of immune activity too much and aggravate immune. So you just want to make sure you're not deficient. Um, but interesting fact of what you just said is what does usually precede all autoimmunity is adrenal exhaustion. Mm. And now if you can't control your hormones, if you can't control the hormonal pathways, if you've got a magnesium deficiency where you can't switch off your HPA axis, they are often causes for adrenal exhaustion anyway. Mm. So you're right, like it links, indirectly it links, mm. but via the adrenal gland, 
um, predisposing to autoimmunity because it's the adrenal gland that releases cortisol after mm. about 10 seconds of immune activity to come out and say, you know, just double check that you're not attacking the wrong stuff here. But it's fascinating, yeah. man. And again, we spoke before about either ill-informed or Machiavellian nature of people mm. selling natural supplements mm. as well too because when I was younger, when I was growing up and selling zinc products in my um, my store, zinc um, uh, uh uh, picolinate was the one to go to mm. but again out of balance a higher doses the body's ability not to switch off vitamin c as well yeah. too but no bioflavonoids again people taking mega doses but they're not it's not efficient it's not effective mm. it, 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 it's sort of forcing stuff yeah. to happen as opposed to and working with the body's natural um you know uh, biosystem you can understand so. why it happens because you've sure you're, you're, you're one that says it a lot too it's like people want to feel something mm. people want to feel things they want to feel that you're inducing change. Um, now, when you're doing natural studies, like for the first five years in clinic, I was very guilty of doing exactly the same thing. I went in everything hard, big mega doses, made sure they forced, made sure change. they felt something. Right. You know, like I was making sure we're turning people inside out, putting them through hell. You got to get worse before you mm. get better. This is a healing crisis. We can't treat your oh. symptoms until we treat the cause. Yeah, and you get them coming back, and you put them through hell. And this is pain. You know, this is what life's all about. Mm. This is what I was taught. And then you're actually starting to realise, man, I, look, this is not quite right. You know, and then I start, you start backing things off a little yeah. bit, start working back with the laws of nature, and you realise that a lot of the stuff that you were taught in your training was taught to you by companies trying to sell products, and they're only form of innovation or their only form of weighing that they're saying it better than the others is to have a stronger dose yes. or, or enhance bioavailability or one of those crappy things people talk about. Right. Because, man, as we learn more about microbiome and mucosal immunity, mm. this whole phase of enhanced bioavailability is going to be looked back at as the biggest joke ever. It's well, like, well, you know, you pick, yeah. pick on um, picolinate, which is perfectly right to pick on picolinate uh, because it's absorbed straight in because it, it, it's a zinc is bound with picolinic acid which absorbs straight in too much zinc is a known suppressant of the immune system huh. so people go oh god i'm, I'm sick uh, zinc's good for my immune system so i need tons more and and they suppress their immune hmm. system further they get sicker further and possibly zinc toxicity you know hmm. it's, it's it's just a terrible thing and they get copper deficiencies and all sorts of things are out of whack so with, it's not and then it. you get the um, imbalance in between the ions and then you're binding because yeah. it's a chelating agent. Mm. So what, Steve, so I said earlier that if you take too much zinc, it'll overstimulate your immune system and aggravate autism. And Steve's just said if you overtake zinc, it'll suppress your immune system. Yeah. Well. So what we're looking at in autoimmunity, it's a confused mm. messenger mm. system with all these receptors. Yep. If you overload on zinc and build too many receptors, then you get too much... Um, specific attack on immune tissue, but then not like, but your total immune cells may reduce, but their specific nature of attacking mm. a tissue will be aggravated. Mm. That's so interesting. That's kind of crazy, but that's why you go back to nature. It's too bloody complicated to be smarter than nature. Hey, if you try to bypass the laws of nature and force shit to happen in the body, it, it, then it, the body goes, hang, 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 man, I'm not designed for that. Like, yeah, every time down, I, I read balance. an immune paper, I, I pick up a new cytokine I've never heard of or a new yep. cell I'm going cytokine to go and are discover. Chemical them. messengers. Yeah, they're they the things are. telling your body, make snot or make yeah. fever or make pain they're the things that do it yeah, and then, and then you, the problem which confuses me mostly about cytokines yeah. is they keep changing the name of these chemicals depending where they come from yeah. if they're from immune cell they call them a cytokine mm. if they're from a fat cell they call them an adipokine yeah. if they're released from a muscle cell they'll be called right. a myokine yeah. but at the end of the day they're released from all of those places mm. at all exactly the same time because mm. that's our innate defense mechanisms so mm. you can't this is why you can't have a specialist specializing in gut or immune mm. or any of that stuff because all of these chemicals they're the same chemicals released from immune cells nerve endings muscles fat tissues all over your body all at once the new the new frontier for the body controlling mechanism is the interstitium so now everyone's going to be talking about the interstitial Never spaces the interstitial. no it's yeah, because it's the watery bits between all the stuff that we've already been talking about oh. <laughs> and now they're finding system. that's where all the chemicals are actually sitting so yeah. we, we don't worry about all these other bits and pieces because th it's all sitting in the interstitium we've got to target that mm. but like i keep saying you go back to the laws of nature a lot of these different compartments in the body are regulated by the mucosal immunity where 80 percent of your immune system is found mm. so 80 percent of your immune system is found on your gut wall mm. and then from there that's where it's programmed and sent to other parts of your body to actually do things so to anything we want to do like seriously mm. I would love to see the difference in stats between an injected vaccine versus an oral vaccine mm. interacting with a mucosa mm. because our mucosal our malt and our galt 
mm. is our mucosal and um, gastrointestinal-associated um, lymphoid tissue, is where your immune system is found. That's when your immune memory is made. That's mm. where antigen-presenting cells are teaching the naive cells of what to do. Mm. And in that instance, that's where our natural medicine works. So most of our natural medicine works by interacting with the mucosa. Yeah. For example, if you have a look at reishi mushrooms, the reason why I, one of the reasons why I love Ganoderma reishi mushrooms is they are so damn clever. Yeah. So what they do is, you know, I said before, a lot of bugs, um, you know, a lot of immune cells will grab bugs, rip them to bits and show their mates. Some bugs, uh, things like envelope viruses, and some bugs, the immune cells suck them in. They don't die. They thrive. They go, you little ripper, I'll just live in here. These immune cells are so full of fuel. The body's putting all its nutrients in the immune cells, so the immune cells starts, they start stealing all the fuel out of the immune cells. Next thing you know, the immune cells trying to tell their mates, hey, there's viruses here, but this virus is sitting in there going, no, 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 no I'm not here. And then what <laughs> happens? And he, and he sends, and he, he actually, okay. yeah, he screws, the, he screws up the chemicals that are released. So, for example, certain viruses, a lot of the mosquito-borne viruses, um, herpes viruses and those sort of things, they'll actually get into the immune cells, happily live. This is how glandular fever keeps coming back. Mm. You know, the Epstein-Barr virus is a classic one for this. Live inside the immune cells happily, Feed on all the stuff that the immune system's got. And the more you support your immune system with mega doses of nutrients and foods and tonic things like ginsengs and astragalus and even those herbs, which we would say are good for prevention but bad during acute because that will actually tonify your immune system and tonify the virus that's living inside the immune wow, cell. Man. And the whole time it's in there, it's sending these messages saying, no, no virus is here. No, no virus is here. Wow. Um, you should just focus on those allergies. And mm -hmm. what happens is with the Epstein-Barr virus and these things, they will actually tell the immune cells not to teach the naive immune cells that there's viruses, but instead teach the naive immune cells that we've got dust, pollen, um, foods to flush it. You go to the sinus and make snot and you forget all about viruses. <laughs> Clever, uh, hey. Yeah, reishi yeah, mushroom, yeah. reishi mushroom goes in, it damages the envelope shell, uh, helps the immune cells to kill the bug. But what it mainly does is it goes through and says, hang on, there's a virus here. Look at that sneaky little bastard sitting mm. in there. It acts again, a derma will go through and say, forget about the allergies for now. I've found a virus. That little spy has been sitting yeah. in there the whole time. It's a double agent. Yeah, yes. and, it sends, and then what happens, so again, a derma goes through and says, hang on now, I'm going to compromise your shell here and I'm going to let everyone know that you're here, you wow. bastard. Cool. And so that's why you go straight in with any mosquito-borne viruses, weird-ass viruses, glandular fevers, and that you don't want to give those people ginsengs, astragalus, um, mega doses of juicing and all that sort of stuff. That's going to put a lot of sugars into the bloodstreams. And you want to mm. starve the virus and you want to feed it the things like the Ganoderma mushroom. Um, another thing that's really good at breaking up the shell is St. John's wort. That's probably yeah. been... that the envelope virus, yeah. It's been probably most well studied out of all the herbs for knocking off envelope viruses yeah, like HIV and herpes and that sort of stuff. Yeah, right. um, problem is it's got so many interactions with mm. other drugs. Mm. So Because it, it, it also helps with P3 or yeah. 4. So it, 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 it aids in the detoxification of drugs, which mm. might sound great, but unless you're on a drug that's... Mm. You know, keeping your blood thin and you get a clot and die. Yeah, so know, St. John's what's that. not as likely, and most people use it as an antidepressant, but yeah. it was always the best antiviral. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, like a lot of those sort of things. So, for viruses, and that, this is why the herbs are really cool. Mm. You have the things like echinacea. Echinacea yeah. is probably one of the most mm. common ones. That would definitely be a you classic can, one can for more though. is not better. Yes. So, all the research on echinacea shows it works like on a, the, the doses on a bell curve. So, basically, lots of little doses during an infection or around flu season works. If you take big doses regularly, or if you take small doses regularly, you, you basically take it regularly, it stops mm. working. Wow. You need to take little bits often when you've got a cold and a flu, mm. and that's Acute. the way it works. And, and that's really funny. I remember hearing this several years ago, actually, Matt, probably you as well too, where you know you go down to the health food store and it's like, oh, I think there was a campaign that they had um, you know, cold and flu season coming, mm. get onto the echinacea mm. now. And it's like, okay, mm. th they were presenting it in the wrong way. It's like kind of get into this and take it through the entire winter season. Yeah. Whereas I think, Matt, you said to me, no, no, just keep that keep in the back drawer. Keep it in the drawer. first aid kit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Keep, keep, mm. keep that in the top drawer. And if you get sick, then then Take use it, it and yeah. pick your battles. Yeah, exactly. It tastes yes. bloody horrible. Mm. So you can't get your kids taking yeah. mega doses every day, is it? Yeah. But oh, Chinese wormwood, oh, yeah. Artemisia. Check this herb out. So this is the herb that that it's. I think it's the first in history of a herbal compound that is now a drug. They didn't change it because they yeah. couldn't perfect it. They couldn't make it better. So its natural form is now an anti-malaria drug. Wow. Yeah, and because it's got multiple compounds that work synergistically together. 
So Beyond Malaria, there's a really cool paper. Actually, I think that's the title of the paper, Artemisia Beyond yeah, the Malaria. Yeah, you actually sent um, it to me. It is yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent paper, and it was basically showing how this Chinese wormwood, in low doses as a salad herb, it's known as sweet any um, when you when you sell it as a salad herb, a lettucey sort of mm. thing. Mm. Low doses, it works like a mod biotic. It helps to control, prevent parasites. It helps to build up your good bugs, kill off the bad bugs, and keep everything under control. In a mega doses, um, um, it'll, it was a 90% inhibition of malaria in 20 hours mm, wow. of that. So it kills off malaria. But now it's also been shown off to knock off a lot of the mosquito-borne viruses. It's antibacterial, it's antiviral, it's antifungal, it's antiparasitic. And it um, um, also helps to, at a low dose regularly, prevent infections as well. Mm. Absolutely brilliant herb. And you just you change the dose depending on what your goal is. Yeah. But you see here, like... I, what I really want to do is show people too, like because we talked about the the hype and the selling and the fear and greed. Let me totally screw with you and tell you what you can grow in your garden or buy at the salad aisles and that sort of stuff to prevent colds and flus. You don't need to be <laughs> rushing out buying <coughs> mega products. We need to understand the fact that your immune system's knocked out of whack because of potential allergies and intolerances and that sort of stuff, and get your histamine under control. The best way to get the histamine under control is start eating perilla every day. Um, mm. That herb, perilla frutescence, throw it into your salads, mix it in with a bit of um, Vietnamese mint and that sort mm. of stuff. Um, Vietnamese mint's got the same sort of compounds in it. A lot of the mints actually do. So a lot of the mints have got these antihistamine compounds, so making lots of salads with that sort of stuff. Thyme and oregano, a couple of the most potent local antiseptics, meaning they'll sterilise mm. and kill off a lot of bugs that are coming through. They've got very good antiviral properties. You can throw thyme, coriander. Oh, where did coriander come from all of a sudden? Um, I just threw that one in. So thyme, um, rosemary, um, rosemary. Yeah. oregano, or oh, basil. That was the one. Basil is amazingly very powerful antimicrobial, antiviral, antibacterial. So throwing in it, making salads, lots of basil, oregano, thyme, lots of mint. Um, dandelion. Dandelion has got a lot of antiviral properties and it's from the leaf, so using that horrible bitter. I mean, anything that bloody horrible is going to scare away. But oh, yeah, it's yeah. lovely the taste. The Vietnamese right? mint and the perilla. So make those sort of things. Lots of garlic, lots of ginger, ginger and that yeah. sort of thing. Cayenne peppers, you cook with peppers. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Really important stuff. And then to get into all that sort of stuff and lots of colours because we've yeah. talked about um, zinc and zinc you'll get from nuts and seeds yeah. and that sort of stuff. Um, but you want lots of colours because you want lots of vitamin A and your carotenoids coming out of everything from tomato paste to anything that's got a dark, intense colour is going to be loaded up with lycopene. Like capsicums. That's where you're going to get your vitamin peppers, A's and that states. sort of stuff. Yeah. 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 So, and you can throw all those sort of things into a juicer if you really want to, but most of these things are going to be found in the pulp and the fibre in the highest doses. So you're going to be throwing away the best stuff. Elderflower, that Zambucus nigra. Yeah, that's, that's probably the most well studied. Recent. I'd say yeah. that's probably the... Uh, Irish oh. moss is still my favourite for oh, like yeah, Irish moss. cough. Yeah. Uh, breaking up coughs are yeah. just as an expectorant, they call it. So an expectorant makes it easier to remove the waste. Yeah. So if you're looking at... You know, viruses, I, I went viruses, for Irish moss the other day. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I could not find it. It went to the... Yeah, it's old school. The, the, mm. I even went to a house. So I went to a uh, mm. pharmacy. No. Nah. Yeah. Um, went to um, uh, a health food store. Oh, no. No, sorry. We don't stock there. Mm. <laughs> It's just like, wow. But yeah, we might have to make one. Also, um, uh, something you can get from a pharmacy is natural is camphor. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Camphor is actually a great cough suppressant too. You know, I took some before this talk because I got some of that. And, uh, you Do you know. like the smell of mothballs? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> They're really hard to spread their legs. Wow. But if you can get in there, I love the smell of mothballs. Um, camphor. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a mothball. <laughs> Gee whiz. <laughs> what do you got a mothball in? Oh, what have you got if you got a mothball in this end and a mothball in this end? Fuck oh, a big moth. Big moth, yeah. Absolutely <laughs> huge moth. Yeah, anyway. So, hey, um, so what I was trying to say, but what I was saying is, so with, with coughs and um, mm. symptom relief, understand, so viruses typically you get a lot more. Viruses, you know when you get that dry cough or you just get a little bit of clear mucus and that sort of stuff, you can you know something's not right. It's mm. dry, it's painful, it's tickly, it's mm. annoying. That's usually in the viral phase. Um, with bacteria, bacteria make pus all the time. Hey, they're very mm. wet, fluidy, pussy yeah. sort of things because the immune cell eats them quite effectively with a bacteria and the dead bacteria is, in immune cells is what pus is. Right. Mm. So with bacteria is when you get the coloured phlegm. And, so, you know, often you get an infection. Initially, it's in a viral 
form um, mm. when you get that dryness and it's everything like that. Then once yeah. you've been coughing, yeah. and so when you get that dry bark and that irritation, you cough, 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 that inflammation starts making mucus mm. as part of the flushing reaction. Mm. That mucus then is predisposed to getting infected by bacteria. So often they'll prescribe an antibiotic to treat a secondary bacterial infection. But if you do good um, cough mixes, so if you make up a good cough mix with things like thyme and elderflowers and mm. all that sort of stuff to soothe the throat, they're also antimicrobial and um, antiseptic, um, meaning that they will get into the mucus, provide an antiseptic thing, because otherwise the mucus sits there, it, it gets deprived of oxygen, it gets deprived of immune activity, it's, it mm. becomes a source of fuel, and other bugs actually live in there and thrive. Mm. If we can have things like thyme, oregano, um, licorice, oh man, I can't believe I forgot to talk much about licorice, yeah. is absolutely amazing because it's very powerful anti-inflammatory. It resembles corticosteroids' effect on the mucosa by taking away the inflammation significantly. But if you've got a virus or a bacteria, it doesn't matter, it stops them from replicating. Mm -hmm. So they just fizzle out and die yeah. off while it's treating the symptoms, which is kind of cool. So. I remember when you gave me that licorice and bark. You go, here, try this. Mm. And I'm like, you gave me these little bits of mm. little, like wood chip almost, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'm like, Looks weird, isn't it? Man, yeah. it's amazing. It's nice, though. Yeah. Eh? Oh, it's amazing. Because yeah. so it's 60 times sweeter than sugar. It won't raise your blood sugar levels. But when you eat the sticks and twigs, you just get that, that pure licorice That's essence great. flavor mm. without all the molasses and sugar. Mm. You know? mm. It's actually a good way to do it, but really good as a herbal tea and that sort of stuff as well. Or just in a fluid extract. In fact, in a lot of Chinese medicine, you'll see in a lot of Chinese formulas, licorice and ginger are added to most formulas because they enhance the activity of the other herbs, mm. right. according to Chinese medicine. But if you do a licorice, ginger, you know, fennel, thyme, um, anise, those sort of things, they all help to... But and a lot of those things you get, like you, if you hear what I just said, the fennel, thyme, anise, they're all Ooh. in my cupboard at home. Yeah, and they're in my spice thing and you can throw them into cups and teas and then mix mm. them into a bit of honey. So for my boys, for example, we'll boil up all these herbs and, they, and you know, they talk about infusions, which is basically just putting in a cup of tea and letting it sit for 15 mm. minutes. A decoction is when you put it in the saucepan and, and boil off about 30% of the water. So you really concentrate it there. So mm. I, that's what I typically do for the boys. I'll boil it down and then we take that stuff out and mix it into a bit of honey and that just soothes mm. their throat. It's funny though, star anise, mm. fennel, mm. aniseed, have, well they yeah. kind of got a similar sort of back yeah. note property. Yeah, oh do, man, you know what's really nice is caraway seeds, hey? I oh, really, yeah. really like yeah. the flavor. I chew them a lot. They really mm. help the fluid in the, in the ear. And the process of chewing caraway seeds, what's happening, you can imagine, that mechanical process is getting your station tubes moving. Mm. It's clearing your ears like they do in the, when you're aeroplane, they say chew something, pop your ears, you know, get chewing. Mm. When you chew caraway seeds, you're actually breaking down the fiber to release the polyphenol compounds in the caraway seeds right next to your bloody ear. Mm. At the same time as you're opening it up, so you're getting it absorbed into that area. It works really, really well. Mm. So Amazing. naturally, prevention, Eat what's in season because, yep. again, in the change of the season, we get an abundance of amazing fruit. Surprisingly, the seeds, the peels, the skins, all of this stuff mm. that's coming through on the change of seasons mm -hmm. usually has compounds that you need in your local area to combat what's mm. likely to hurt you in that local area. Yeah, Nature's sure. smart like that. So eat what's in season, eat what's local. Start loading up on the salads. Start hooking into the garlics, the ginger. Make sure there's no zinc deficiency. Make sure there's no vitamin C deficiency. And surprisingly, make sure there's no magnesium deficiency. Mm. Magnesium is something I would never have talked about. Maybe, I mean, I'm a bit biased because we just released a magnesium yeah. product uh, and re reading it. But cool. that spun me out that that... I never thought of magnesium as providing an off switch for all of these reactions. Yeah. I always looked at nerve muscle, but I didn't think of mucus. inflammation, yeah. mucus, that sort of stuff. It's crazy, man. Why mm. not? And the only other thing is avoid um, during acute infections. Like for prevention, that's when you use your ginsengs, you use your astro. So prevention and recovery from convalescence. I don't, you, don't get, you never get to use those words in conversation nah. normally. You read them for decades. You never get to use words like convalescence. So use ginsengs and astragalus for prevention and recovery. But during an acute infection, you don't want to be loading tonics into your mm. bloodstream because they're going to tonify a virus before they tonify you, especially an envelope one living in your immune cells. And you don't want to be taking mega doses of sugar into your bloodstream because that's mm. what the bugs feed on. Mm. So some people are go, man, I'm going to go juice like crazy. Or bread and flat lemonade. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the flat, but yeah. my mum used to make me sit there and stir the bubbles out of the lemonade oh, yeah. and then drink it off the spoon yep. to, to settle my tummy. And that um, creates osmotic diarrhea and feeds mm, sugar into your bloodstream. Yeah, well, that's right. And, and, and sugar immediately for taking a lot of refined sugar. This is the thing. If you're mm. sick, it, I, it still it amazes me to this day when people have got a cold or a flu, the first thing that they reach for is like, you know, milk or custard or, you know, 
<laughs> mucus causing compounds. Yeah, right, yeah. What's Dairy. That move, that, oh, um, skanker man. Milk was a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, it surely <laughs> Milk was. was a bad choice. And, and, and the other one is obviously the comfort foods. Oh, I'm just going to stay home. And then they pull yeah. out the box of chocolates, or yeah. then they go and get some some sweets, or they go and get something with refined sugars, which is just absolutely destroying your immune system. Yeah. In, in terms of it suppresses it massively. I, when I, you I look up how the much old sugar retards it. You look up the old research, um, the old macrobiotic recipe books and that sort of stuff where they used like like um like in Chinese medicines. See all Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine, they're not medicine, they're foods. Yeah. So it's teas, soups, stews and all that sort of stuff. That, so their actual medicine model is making food at home. So have a look at those sort of things because you know in the Chinese they use the rice congees and that sort of stuff mm. where they'll use the old rice which is making resistant starches and that sort of stuff. They'll boil it down and it's just there basically to hold up all of the other compounds which is usually a fair bit of um you know, like we're talking four cayenne peppers, yeah. spices, all the spices ginger, stuff. and that sort of stuff. So, I, yeah. I, I love it, my son. There's, there's a couple of things. One, if you if you've got a cold or a flu or a sickness, avoid sugar, sugar specifically refined sugar. Yeah. Two, yeah. if you've got a cold, please don't take dairy. The third well, it's one, mucus forming. The, yeah. the, the third yeah. one that my son does all the time, mm. the poor bugger, is when you've got ulcers. Avoid chocolate like the plate because the arginine there is just going to take mm. them to the next oh, level. Yeah. Man, do you know what my what you, I do for Veggie? ulcers? Vegemite. Vegemite. Yeah. Yeah, load them up Vegemite. Oh, yeah. So for our American listeners that don't like Vegemite, try to put it on a sting and ulcer. Yeah. And you really hate it. Yeah, and the Australians who don't like Vegemite. Mm. Or but Marmite. Virus, they're, they're a virus too, aren't they? Mouth ulcers are a little virus. Yeah. They're related to the cocksucking bee virus, aren't they? <laughs> the cock... The, the what? The cocksucking what bee virus. <laughs> Cocksucky bee virus. Mm. Yeah. yeah We've got to be careful of the pronunciation with that one. Yeah. yeah. But what do you mean? It, it, it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with herpes, obviously, because also they're upset. They're yeah, often associated with cocksucking too. You're right. <laughs> yeah. But that that's... um. <laughs> That's all cut. But in terms of <laughs> no, you can't. That's yeah. gold. No, that's that's, that's that is verifiable infectious gold. humour. That it's is very oh, infectious oh, humour. You like that? Oh, jeez. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Actually, it's not bad. Um, but in terms of um, yeah, just simple things like that that you can do to actually support your recovery and reduce your pain. <laughs> Rest, uh. drink fluids. You know, hot lemon drinks. These are all good things <laughs> too. You know, just just chill out. Get get well. You know, I reckon mm. take take some multi food too. I reckon that's very important to get your nutrients out. Make sure, you yeah. And the other thing, you don't want to overload the bug. You don't want to overload your body with mega doses of things because no. the bugs will get it first. Mm. The bugs are floating around your bloodstream and in your gut, mm. and you Active go load cell. up with nutrients. They love it. They feed on. It. They're mm. faster feeders than us. They're going to take it all and tonify. So throw in poisons. They'll mm. take that in first. Yeah, and starve them because yeah. when they're starved. Like if you starve the bugs, they're hungry mm. and they'll suck in, they're more likely to suck in the poison. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks guys. That's it for this week and we'll be back next week. No, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. No, thanks. We're out of here. You're creeping me out. <laughs> You're creeping me out. <laughs> okay. Uh. Thanks for listening. And remember, question everything. Well, except what we say. <laughs> <laughs>